It's, it's such an information-rich day. Every, each one of the presentations is so full of stuff. Um, and so I kind of could talk to you about storytelling, which is, I'm sort of going to do, and then sort of engage in doing some storytelling together. It's just really, really hard to do that with such a massive group of people. Why don't I just do a musical for you? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, inclusion the musical. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to do that. So, um, what I wanted to do was, um, and maybe Ramu can be my person. I feel like she's my sister when I'm here. This is a big family loving. I sort of trace her around the place. Clearly, I'm the baby sister. <laughs> well, I'm probably four times her age. So, if we, can we go over here together? Um, well, I guess, you know, it's easy to go tell a story, make it exciting, invite somebody in, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I think for those of you who heard me gabble on <laughs> this morning, um, I guess I'm really committed to looking for the tricky bits as much as I'm a little bit frightened of living in a world where we convince ourselves that we're doing inclusion. And it... it then I don't want to sound like the killjoy either, you know, um, that, you know, I, um, so it's, it's trying finding that space to be able to say, yes, of course we're good people with goodwill and everything we are doing is in the interest of people living a life free from discrimination. And I think about, you know, that presentation we just had, um, you know, what does it mean for people to actually have access to services so that they can have a decent life? I mean, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I guess, um, you know, one of the things that comes out of a long line of activists, you know, people like Louise Doman Sparks and Elizabeth Dow from the anti-bias work that's happened across the world, is this thing about people telling their stories and whether those stories are their professional stories or whether their stories are their personal stories or a combination of those. Um, and then what it means as humans to tell a story that isn't your own. And I guess this is where I come back to that space of the only me that I can be is the one that you make me, because I'm not me without you. So, so there's uniqueness about me, something about me, um, and all of you, but I don't know that there is such thing as an individual. And this is where it's a little bit of, you know, the table off the dining table trick thing, that it's not that I want us to not see the uniqueness of each child and each human and each person and each life. I want that more than anything. And I want that to be discrimination free and I want it to be beautiful. My, when people say to me, what's your philosophy? I say, a beautiful life. I want every single living thing on this earth, including dirt, air, all of those things to have a beautiful life. Um, and so how to do that in a way that is discrimination free is for me, as I've done in my learning, recognising that I'm not a me without everybody else. So it doesn't, we don't, we fall into this trapping of there's the group and then there's the individual and then there's the individual within the group. But I think that there's something more nuanced. I think there's something more, more I don't want to say complicated because I don't want it to sound negative. I think there's something more skizhubululi. <laughs> I can't spell that. Um, that brings us together. So when I, when I walk on the sand, my feet become sandy. And I, my feet change because they're walking in the sand. The sand will either make them tougher or it'll take a bit of a layer of <laughs> scrubbing that needs to be done um, off. So there's a relationship. I leave a piece of myself with every footstep that I take, not just metaphorically, not just in terms of the footprint, but my skin comes off and the sand sticks to my foot. So how can I say that I'm not made of sand? When I am dive into the ocean, our skin is semi-permeable and I'm obviously excreting from my pores, nowhere else I'll have you know. Um, and you know, so I'm absorbing whatever the content or, or makeup of the sea is into my body, mostly through my nose from getting dumped by a wave. <laughs> but, and the sea is also taking a part of me. So how can I say that I'm an individual when I've dived into this ocean, which is the home of so many 
critters and and magical phosphorescence, which I love. How can I say that I'm an individual if I'm made of those things right there, right now? Yeah? Well, it is star stuff, but it's actually the very practical. You know, you we're sitting at these tables now, putting our hands on the tablecloth. There's minerals and oils and everything coming for our skin onto that table, through, onto the paper now. We're, we're spreading ourselves around all the time. And some people go, ew, and that's only because we've got like weird hygiene stuff going on. <laughs> Lick the floor and you'll never get a cold. Um, did I say that out loud? <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Because <laughs> uh, there goes my invitation next year. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so I think... And what's the table made of too that we're putting our hands on so we're all a part of the universe or one and together and interacting and together. Yeah, and that's where the term, I'm so glad you said the term interacting and it's not just with what we think natural materials are, it's the same as plastic. Our stuff and imprints still go onto plastic. It's not like it's, an, I mean plastic's made of oil anyway. It comes from somewhere. Everything comes from somewhere. So this whole idea of becoming is that we're constantly becoming in these ways that we don't even think about. And it, when you said inter, inter, interactive, I'm going to introduce you to a word now, which you may already know, but there's that concept of interactive, which is like this. And inter means into and going like that. There's another little front of a word bit, which I don't know what they're called properly, which is intra. And that's more than just into, it's kind of becoming with like imagining the oils from, and minerals from your skin going into the paper or the tablecloth or your clothes and then into the washing machine and then down the drain and then out to the sea. So you're moving around all, but physically, not just in a, like a woo-woo way, but in a, a tangible, physical, traceable way in a sense, yeah? So with, that's, I guess, the premise on which my, my life is lived and my work is done. And to be intraactive and interactive means that we're not just interacting with each other and hello, how are you, and we're having this exchange. There is actually a transference of something to another. So if I touch you and I'm abs you're absorbing me and I'm absorbing you. How's that going down for you, honey? <laughs> <laughs> the energy field. <laughs> <laughs> but so now I have, I have somebody else's story into my skin that will eventually go in into my bloodstream and become my molecules. How can I possibly be an individual? It's a little bit of a rather large concept. I love it because it suddenly takes the pressure off what it means to be this individual person. And the minute we have these individual units, we start trying to tell all these individual stories. And then we go, let's make a theme of what's common in those individual stories. And then we have these generalizations, all of which are also very useful. I don't think that we can you know, throw one baby out with the bath roller or chop the whole bath out and hold on to the baby or the water or the otherwise. We wouldn't have the saying if we didn't have the baby, the bath, water and the bath, yeah? So, yeah, so thinking through the way that storytelling, rather than being an I narrative, that it's a with narrative. Not even an us narrative, because us still implies that there are separate things that come together. But if it's a becoming worldly with narrative, then suddenly I think we've got a more powerful story to tell. And we use this in our activist strategies in the social justice group. And we use, I use this as a method of teaching in university. And I use it with children and all over the place. And the first thing that I like to do with this, which is going to be tricky to do with the group, but we're going to make it happen, even if we just get through the first part, is to say, so find, find a partner um, and say, rather than saying, tell me something about yourself, just encounter that person for a moment, that you've been breathing the same air all day, that you've been sitting in the same room with, your ears have been sharing the same knowledge even though they might have been doing different things with them. So there's this sonorous landscape, there's a physical landscape, and I want you to pick someone, whether you know them or not doesn't even matter, but I guess what I want to do is build a narrative where I say, I'm going to tell you something about you. So start the story, by being brave and saying, let me tell you something about yourself, sister. <laughs> and 
And what would happen if we started our narratives that way? And what would happen if the way that I started my story was to say, I am you. I'm you today. It's a very large comma, people. <laughs> it's just turned into a semicolon. <laughs> it might be in the next paragraph. So we can't go, we tell ourselves, we give of ourselves, but we're incredibly selective about that. What if I say to somebody, and I think about what you've just talked about, children with a disability, and you say to somebody who's different, and you think about the way that power hierarchies work, language hierarchies work, racialised hierarchies work, I mean, they're all full of crap, but they still work that way. What happens if I say, I am you? And what it feels like to be you, because I feel very connected to you, which just happened over email. <laughs> you friend. <laughs> I am you. And how exciting it feels for me to be able to say to almost a stranger, but somebody I encounter, how exciting I can be you today because I'm with you. Without being too evangelical. But what does it mean to say that? And what does it then feel like to encounter difference. And who wouldn't you say that to? Who would you feel uncomfortable saying, I am you? Would you feel comfortable saying that to me? <laughs> say? I don't know. I've been sitting here thinking, what's she going to make me do? <laughs> Be my friend, Holly. Yeah. Do you come to my party? <laughs> No, but what does it feel like? So, I, thank you for being the, the test run. It's a scientific experiment. <laughs> what happens if you say to me, I am you? How does that make you feel? Say it to me. <laughs> I am you. How does that feel? Uh, it feels curious, actually, because I don't know you. Yeah. So, it's like, well, who? I am you, but what does that mean? And who does it make you? Yeah. Well, yeah. So what it does is, instead of saying, oh, tell me about, tell me about yourself. Tell me one thing about you. Do not fire. Tattoos are a big part of my life. Hi, this is Ranu, and tattoos are a big part of her life. Now that is something, it is important, and I can conjure a whole lot of reasons why that may be. But where does that, where do I go with that? Perhaps, I mean, I'm not saying it's a wrong way to start. Mm -hmm. If I'm asking, if I'm gleaning something from her, then Is I'm... Is it an acceptance? Well, it could be. I'm getting a piece of information to build on, but I don't want to do that. I want to do storytelling in another way. If we're really embedding and embracing and ensconcing and, and sandwiching and all those other words that I used, what happens if I say to Ranu, I am you? And Ranu said that she feels curious, <laughs> probably slightly terrified, but curious to say, I am you, to me. She's wanting to find out more. What to, so can you talk a little bit more about the curious, given that I put you on the spot now? Oh, um, so I want to know, um, so when I say curious, it's what's made you, what's made you ask the questions you've asked why are you where you are at now? Yeah. And what a wonderful thing to wonder about a person. But if I had to say, hi, I'm Red Ruby Scarlet, and I like red. <laughs> <laughs> would that make, what would that make you wonder? You go, well, why do you like red? And da, 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 And then we stay in a really safe place. Mm -hmm. But if I say, I am you, I'm reaching for you. It, and it creates a space of questioning. It deliberately creates this little opening of then where do we go with this conversation? And look at the openings of questions of why are you thinking it, what's going on in your mind? The questions that come up, it's pretty out there, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get you to do that. With, I mean, do it with anyone. If you wanna do it with someone you know, but even with someone you know, it's still a bit of a spin out. 
But I guess, it, and it's, I'm not trying to reverse storytelling, I'm not trying to reverse a paradigm. But this is something very, very special that I learned. And I didn't learn it in English, so it doesn't, it doesn't work the same in English. So it's, it's even more weird for me doing it in English because I didn't learn how to do it in English. But what happens when that's the way that you begin to share a story? So what I want you to do now is find a, find a friend and encounter them and begin your story. And I don't want you to necessarily start then telling the story, but the pressure isn't for you to do that. What I want you to do is think about how it feels to look at somebody and say, I am you. Yeah? Is anyone terrified? <laughs> isn't that interesting? My, isn't that interesting? But if I said to you, turn to someone and say, hi, how would you feel? <laughs> no problem. <laughs> what does that say when we decenter the individual? What does it say when we decenter ourselves from our starting place? It's the unfamiliar. We're immediately working with the unfamiliar. And it can feel scary, but it is so rich. And it's, this isn't precipice. I'm not pushing you off the, off the cliff yet. <laughs> but it is how to have an encounter in a, in a very different way. All right, so big deep breaths. Find a person. <laughs> Yeah. But I can get you a little bit there. What do you find? 
trying to get out from us is the word individuality. Individuality, individual. Mm -hmm. So it means that maybe to me, where I came from, my father was having a different philosophy. But I think similarly. Oh, me and your old man go back years. Yeah, the old man used to say that. I'm him. There is no any human being in this world different from him or he or her. We were created by one woman and one man. Yeah. But somehow something happened and we suppressed it. So there is no individuality to say that I'm better than you or you're better than me. Yeah. Or you are different than I'm different. Otherwise, can I be a self? So then I got it from the shadow thing. And always I see when people judge me or judge my community because of assumption, I take it in a different way, thinking that maybe these people that haven't learned something different from their life. Then you come and see that we are all the same. Thank you. And thank you for participating. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. Does somebody else want to share what happened? And what they think? I was thinking... Oh, one at a time, please. Goodness <laughs> gracious! <laughs> I was thinking how I could use this with the children within like, a classroom situation. I, you know, if I was that, to say that to a little one, how would... How would they perceive me? Would they look at me as silly or I, I, don't know, I don't know. If I was to say, I am you, and they'd look at me as if to say, with Carolyn, you're a nut, you know? <laughs> hey, I've had that response. <laughs> so the one thing that I've asked you to do is given us two really very different but very interesting thought processes. One's taken us back to current experience and back to a family trajectory. You've taken it into wondering what would happen in a relationship in your professional context. Yeah. Okay, so we had two other people volunteering. Habibi. Uh, Habibi, thank you. Shukran. <laughs> uh, when she first told me um, I'm you, so like many things came to my brain. What does she mean with I'm you? Does she mean that she's healing me and she's going to help me or support me? or she knows so much about me or what she wants to pull out from me. So I feel kind of relaxed and not comfortable. <coughs> at the really. same time. Yeah. Which is another really interesting example. So three completely different responses and all of them as equally valid as each other. You know, what counts as valid knowledge? Each of these. You're, you're, it's drawing stories out of you. Unexpected stories. And the thing about yours is that there are two conflicting things going on at the same time. Partly there's this thing, oh yeah, I'm relaxing into this, isn't this fascinating? Somebody's curious about me, but at the same time, does she think she knows me? What, you know? And how far she knows about me. And how far. And so these, when you tune into the sensibilities, partly it's what you think and what goes through your mind, but partly it's about how you feel. And it's not just how you feel emotionally. Look, how, look at the hesitance in the room to undertake this little task of saying to another human being, I'm you. It's quite simple, really. It's three teensy-weensy little words, but look at the enormity of how people feel it in their skin. Yeah? And I've got some... Actually, would you like to go first? Sure, yes. Um, when I, when I, I did that, I was looking for commonalities between us. So... I, Peas in a pod! <laughs> yeah, well, we're both human beings, yeah. you know, we're women, and that's why I admire the gentleman, you know, that he was able to draw even, and go back even further, you know, to, you know, how his family was formed, but that's, that's what I was thinking, it was um, just the common human experience, you know, that, well, we're all human beings, we're all on this planet, um, so for me, the exercise drew out um, what we have in common, um, that, that's what I got out of it. Can I jump to you to say how did you feel when she said I am you? Um, I felt a little bit uncomfortable at the start, but when she was um, speaking on, you know, what we had in common, I felt really at ease and 
yeah, attached sort of to her, so it was really nice. Yeah, like you make a connection mm. really. Mm. And so what you've done is um, you, you've thrown the social mores out the window, and of course that's when people are confused. What the you know? But mm. that's a, that's a terrific um, way of yeah, people realizing that you know we are unity. We are one. <laughs> we are many. Yes, I have. Yeah, my, my, I have a lot of people saying, "And what did you study? How to confuse people?" And now I can confidently go away and say I've succeeded in that. Okay. So let me start. Does anybody else want to say anything before we move on? Uh, I was just going to say it's it's also breaking up the custom. It's customary to say, "Hi, how are you?" The first time you meet somebody. So. And I go, "Do you really mean that?" And they go, "What?" I <laughs> quite often the other Chinese, I really don't want to like that. Mm. Hi, how are you? Yeah. But it's it's that feeling, you know, when you're changing that, it's it's putting you in an uncomfortable position because it's not a normal place that you put yourself in first mm. on that first um, you know, greeting. Mm. And so here's where there's this really interesting imbroglio of um, social mornays. Lobster Mornay, social mores, um, etiquette, politeness, culture, things that we take for granted, things that we don't, you know, it's these everyday, th I'm interested in the everyday stuff that just gets, it's the discrimination practices that you can't trace because you say, hi, how are you? And it's not that we don't mean it, it's just that we're rehearsed in doing so. And I do, I will say to the shopkeeper, I'll say to anybody, do you mean that? Do you really want to know how I am? I'm desperate for a pedicure. I've got a massive blister on this foot. I'm missing my cat. And they go, nutter. Just like your kid. So, but you know, and it's just like, well, do, why, why frame it as a question? The other thing is that somebody eliciting something from you, how are you, makes you think that they're actually interested in you. Um, but to say, I am you, is another kind of invitation to say, let's talk about desire. Let's talk about who we would stand beside with, intra-related, knowing that we are all connected as humans in some way, shape or form through whatever trajectories. For some people, those are physical, for some it's spiritual, for some it's, you know, the whole range of different ways, all of which are valid forms of being connected. Um, but when you, when you have a statement that says, I'm you, It's puzzling. It could be acceptable, like if there is one, or you want to show your solidarity to person. You see him that he's, he, 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 he or she needs this solidarity. You can say I'm you. It means you feel this sorrow. You feel this feeling. At that time, the other one will feel really comfortable. And you can build that. You can build into culturally. It's probably non-PC in many different cultural traditions. Eye contact is not always appropriate. There are people who are just generally shy and don't want to be looked at and don't want to be put on the spot. So there's a whole range of different, you know, personality and cultural layers to think through. But it is interesting when you do this with children and even, even in groups of adults, and you don't have to say this out loud, but how many of you looked around and thought, who would I... Who could I comfortably say this to? And who do I have more trepidation in saying this to you? You know? And who would I... Am I really meaning it when I say I am you? Am I making this an encounter? And am I making this an event to say that I want to connect with you? Or whatever it is, for whatever purpose. Because we can each decide those, purpo those purposes. Or purposes. Um, but it... Who are the people in, in your mind that you wouldn't say that to or that you would feel more uncomfortable saying it to than others? And I'm not trying to be, you know, spoil the party person, but I think this is that very deep stuff around, you know, whether it's around race, whether it's around transgenderism, whether it's around sexuality, whether it's around disability, <coughs> any of those things. And there's a, a, beautiful, um, a beautiful philosopher called Emmanuel Levinas. Even his name's nice to say. Levinas. 
Levinas, we call him in the western suburbs. Levinas, we call him in in, in <laughs> And he has this this thing that he talks about the face to face. How can I come face to face with someone or something and have an encounter where you absolutely have an exchange that you can't describe? And it's, it is a physical change of looking or touching or whatever because people have different, you know, abilities and a little word. And then completely absorb them but not grasp them. Is it like love at first sight? I don't know because I haven't had that. Mm -hmm. But you may be able to enlighten us. I, I think it's more than love at first sight but I think love is definitely part of it. Mm -hmm. Because we are really particular about who we love and who we don't love. I'm just going to jump to your response for a minute. So we chatted too and I said what happened What happened when I said that and do you want to say how you felt about your identity and oh, that? Um, I said uh, if, that I want to, oh, I can't remember what I said. I want to be me and this is who I am and I don't want to let that go because <laughs> it belongs to me. Yeah, and that's that's actually a little bit what I was searching for. Oh, chose the right person <laughs> um, <laughs> to be able to go. How can I encounter have this face to face encounter with you, but not take anything from you? But I can look at you and say without fear, I have no fear of you. I am you. I have no fear. In which case, I'm so curious about you, and I'm want to have this encounter and whatever, whatever, whatever. And you think about the way staring works, people in wheelchairs. <coughs> and my grandmother did it once. She goes, chuck me in that chair and let's see if people stare at me. And I thought, well, that's you're going to stare at you anyway, love. And it was really interesting to see the way people looked at her and the way people looked at me, pushing her and her sitting there and everything, and how people encountered her. And then she goes, quick, get me out, and did a very same lap while those same people were looking and how they looked at her differently. And, you know, this is this is like a you know shopping Christmas holiday social experiment with absolutely no <laughs> ethics, no anything about it at all. But it is one. It's just those examples of what are the situations of difference that we will smile at or will look away because it's ru rude. Um, all of these things, and that's actually part of how you build a story about who you are. And we've heard this morning about how people write all sorts of things into stories around trauma. What are the things that are completely invisible in stories that are told when it comes to building a service support for people. What's missing? What are the myths? You know, keep those people away from those supports. That's Australian money. All that racist stuff, basically, that's institutionalised. So it is that thing about who can I look at and say I am you without fear. And this is about difference and it's about desire. And where does this come from for me? It comes from a story, when I was doing my honours degree, I did a, um, I was looking at popular culture and Barbie and superheroes and all that sort of stuff because I was convinced I could make the boys sit down and do have really good literacy. Of course, the minute I got in there, it was all around gender and race and all these other things. And there was a, a beautiful, a beautiful, um, I can't say what country she was from, a beautiful um, Indigenous Australian child and she uh, had very dark skin. She was with this group of girls, besties, and they were all white middle class children. And they loved Barbie and they were all pink and they were Barbie and it would all go on, the stories, everything. And at times she would become excluded based on her skin colour. And what drove her to want to be part of that particular group, part of that particular play? It's a form of desire to be something, to be you, to be like you. To be like you or to be you? To be next to you to be with you, to be near you, to be around you, to be you. And the way that she became part of that group, the way that she became white, was to wear a pink jumper that had Barbie written on it. Because Barbie equaled white. Now we can think that that's a really sad story. Part of it is. Racism's going on. Incredible strategy because the white children couldn't argue. She had the Barbie t-shirt on, so she was actually the superhero. She was like, hang on, I'm chucking this on people. Couldn't get excluded for that because it was like, you know, a Barbie jumper. Gave her this ticket into this other world of being 
And, you know, she talked about how she felt different. She felt white in this jumper. And I was like, I could pathologise that and say there's a problem with this kid. And I, I, I look back at how I've written that story up and I'm actually not happy with it because I think I've actually invested in racism and racist practices myself as a non-Aboriginal person, as a person who looks around. My skin's actually blue and purple most of the time, far from white. But, um, you know, and I look back and I think, how did I write about that? What did I say publicly about that story? Um, and what are the other things that I could have seen when she was having this encounter, this face-to-face -face encounter. There's a desire. And it was funny how she had this desire to participate. And the rules were white rules. And she completely subverted them with a pink jumper, which is even more, um, what do you call it? Off the Richter scale. What's, a, what's an intellectual word for that? Um, arbitrary, arbitrary rules. And then the girls would be desiring her. <coughs> so clever. But look at this movement of strategy. Look at this movement of encounter. Look at this movement of what can go on between people when desire is a driving force. And we go, okay, that's not about us, that's about children, whatever. How many people walk down the street? Oh my God, my leg, I'm so old. <laughs> I need my Zimmer phone back. <laughs> You're walking down the shops and you catch it and you go... <laughs> we do it all the time. How many of us have whitening teeth, toothpaste and, and sun cream and all those kinds of things? And we may not have all of the products, but we invest in them. There are so many everyday practices where we're looking in the mirror and we change the way we look because, and then we can say, I am you, once we've changed the way we look. Yeah? I'm not saying we've all got psychological problems and that we all need to go and get help. I'm talking in a very different paradigm. I'm saying we are made up of so many different stories and some of them we're not even aware of. Can you look in the mirror and say, I am you, to yourself? What curiosities would spark up? Would they be the same? What criticisms would you make of yourself? What high fives would you give yourself? What would go through your mind if you had that encounter with yourself as a point of difference? I think generally as a whole, females don't do that. You don't look in the mirror and say, oh, I, I like you. I think as a, as a you know, females who take a book, I'm you and I don't like those thighs. And that Oi! <laughs> on, a, on a whole, I think we'll do that. Because I'm sitting here thinking, you like my thighs? <laughs> she doesn't like them! <laughs> as a coloured person, um, the message has always been, you are not me. So it's like, I'm not you, I don't want to be you. And I, but as in a white person. But I'm also not a black person and I want to be a black person because I'm me. So I don't want to be you because you've told me I can't be you. And I don't want to be you because you've told me I can't be you either. So I'm just... And I'm saying I'm you. I'm going to be me. Yeah. I'm really spun you <laughs> <laughs> I do have a curry spot. <laughs> but I mean, that, that I think this is where, especially when we're looking in, in race relations, I mean, everything is a race relation. You know, there's a colleague of mine in London and she's a white middle class woman and her and I are doing this stuff around race because she wrote something in English and I was like what and she goes you read English she's like not that English I don't know a different one and so we're looking at the nuances in whiteness um, without getting too self-indulgent but you know what happens if we say I am you and what what happens if we say I am you in this situation is there a power dynamic am I trying to does it feel colonial if I say that to you as a non-indigenous person that's what crossed my mind before, is for me to say, a white privileged middle class woman to say to um, a black um, underprivileged African woman, I am you, that's so not right for me that I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever presume that I would have any understanding of what their life has been like. Mm. I don't know if it means you've got any understanding of them. That's not the purpose, and I'm really glad you said that. It's interesting too, and I hope you don't mind me 
raising this issue about language, talking about privilege, and I, I say that word too, I must, I've, got to, I've got to put myself on the ears with that, is that if it's not, it's not that you're privileged or she's underprivileged, it's that we live in a world that has got weird arbitrary structures that make us believe that there are some people that are more privileged than not. It's not the people that are the problem. It's the way that society is structured that disadvantages people. Yeah? And that's the whole thing. We talk about disadvantaged communities. It's not the people that are vulnerable or disadvantaged. It's the structure of our society that makes them experience disadvantage and lack, lack of access to resources. Sure. So which is probably what you meant. And it's, But I just wanted to pick that point up because, I, I mean, I've got to watch myself too. Um, you know, oh, I'm so privileged can sometimes feel... Um, colonial. Sure. Yeah. And so it is, the point is not to say, I know all about you and I own you and I'm, I want to grab you. And that's why I talked a little bit about Levinas. Because the problem with Levinas's theory was it was all about human to human. Because you can do this with a tree, with a chair. You can do it with a handful of sand, the ocean, the sky, the air. I am you. What will it make you wonder? And the beautiful thing is, it's made everybody wonder something and something different. And my question to you is, who, who, will you, who are you willing to ask that question to? And if you have trepidation, then what does that mean around the things that you believe about yourself? You know, like you just said, I'm not this person, I'm not this person, I'm not this person, and I want to keep who I am. So it does this, it does, it has another function where it actually kind of consolidates who you are and those special parts about you and your stories that you shouldn't have to give away to anybody, you know? And I remember when I was writing Talking Up, there was a woman and she said to me, you know, it's really great that you want me to tell my story, but do you know how many times I've told my story? That's all people want to hear. They want to hear the story, then they feel good because they've heard me tell the story, and then they just go on doing things as it was before. So there's got to be a different way to encounter what it means to tell a story. She said, you start telling your story. You start telling your story about what it's like. How come it's always, you know, the NESB people, and who she called the NEFB people, which I quite liked, <laughs> the NESB people. It's these people, it's the children, it's whatever. Where, where are your stories? Why is it there's this invisible story that's never told? And I was like, whoa. And I loved that. I loved having that... Um, that spin around of, you know, we tell our stories and people go, oh, we've heard the stories and they're amazing, I'm so inspired and wonderful, but doesn't it actually change who we are or what we do? And so I'm not suggesting this is an answer. I'm trying to cause a whole lot of problems and then leave you all dangling. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm running away. <laughs> I'll send you all love hearts. <laughs> but the purpose is, the purpose of the whole event is to have this thought process because like this morning, you're not gonna be able to stop thinking about this. And whether you like it, whether you don't like it, whether you think it's the dumbest thing you've ever heard, whether you think it's the amazing thing you've ever heard, I actually don't mind. I'm not, I'm not invested in making you think what I think. <laughs> Goodness help you if you did. <laughs> but with, it's more about saying, if I can give you something that provokes you to keep you thinking, a different way to encounter, to go and ask people, what would you do if somebody asked you this? It immediately keeps question and reflective practice going in a very, in a very meaningful, very... Um, authentic kind of way. So two people have got questions. Or you want to say something, sir? I was going to say that in your in your uh, analysis of asking someone about his story, same to me if you ask me where are you from, and you know that I'm here in Australia, I would be very proud to say that I'm originally from Australia. But if I responded back to you and say, what about you? Yes, exactly. And then what if I said, I'm from South Sudan? I would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon you'd be my pants on fine. Like, absolutely. And you know, we've even had TV commercials of the, you know, this Vietnamese woman sitting there and, and she goes over to the friends, you know, the white family's friends for dinner and they go, oh, where are you from? She goes, Burke, you know, eating, eating the barbecue. So I think there's, it, it also raises some lovely stuff about those assumptions. And I'm not trying to give you the answer of what to say or how to say it, but exactly. So we've got a, cup, a question here and a question there. Yep. Can we pop to the front and then come back to you, madam? Thank you.
So um, this practice of uh, IMU quite um, very much reminded me of a practice that I tried a few years ago. So basically, my teacher, sorry, <laughs> uh, my teacher um, asked us to do a practice, um, try it out for one one week, or maybe try it out for one month. And that uh, the homework is that every day you try to kiss one person. Have one person. Being passion just like a <laughs> one. <laughs> That's a health risk. <laughs> with, with compassion. But, but, so you can physically do so, or you can do that in your mind. So because I was uh, living a solitary life at that time, and so I tried to uh, pick the target in my mind. <laughs> I thought I felt something in my ear earlier today. <laughs> You know, I was I had a very busy life in Tokyo, and every morning I was um, in this packed train going to my work, and I thought, okay, who is uh, uh, who am I going to pick today to give a kiss and uh, give a hug in in my mind? All right, mm, that person, do I feel comfortable kissing that person or hugging that person? On um, that bored man, that middle-aged man, that uh, that lady there, uh, well. Well, if, if I feel more like hugging her, is it because she's cuter? <laughs> yeah, so we, and I feel like I'm listening to myself talking, this little talk, and I think oh, it's a great um, opportunity to, to observe my thoughts, to practice that introspection, and also to practice compassion and uh, empathy. So. Why do I not feel comfortable to hug that person, to kiss that person? Is that because of their um, external appearance? Yeah. Yeah. So, and uh, I heard from um, my teacher that he had pictures of all sort of people, you know, on his wall. So, a uh, black or, or, or Asian, whatever um, a race group, whatever age group. So, he had a picture on that. So, every day he look at them and say, okay, I'm sending you some love. I'm sending you love with my hug, with my kiss. And I'm sending my compassion to you. And I think when we say, I am you, um, and I feel that I'm trying to put away all these external things. Just like one time um, I mentioned... Can I interrupt for a minute? I'm, I don't, I don't okay. want to not hear the story, but I just want to respond. Yes, I think this, this practice of loving somebody else mm -hmm. is beautiful. I guess I'm thinking in a more sociological paradigm to say, why is it? Is it that I want to send love to somebody or is it that I'm willing to start having another layer of that internal dialogue with myself to say, I don't want to say I am you because I recognise that there's some, there's a, there's a story that I've been told and I've told myself that I don't have desire around you. So it's a sociological thought process around race and racism. And it's not saying that you've got to desire everybody and want to and want to be, you know, have this encounter with anybody. But when you get that, oh, maybe not that person, of course, send them all the love in the world. Agree. And compassion and all those things. I, I agree with those principles. What I'm asking people to do is to recognise what why is it that that person isn't somebody that I feel like I could say, I'm you. Genuinely. Genuinely, out loud, look at somebody and say, I'm you. Because it is incredibly confronting. Or say to somebody, say that to me. Say to me, I am you. I am you. Yeah, and in a way that is, Jean Pool, <laughs> um, in a way that is, <laughs> you know, in a way that's actually starting to go, what are the discrimination practices in myself that I can't trace? Because how do I live a life free from discrimination? And that's the purpose of this exercise and the purpose of encountering this. Not to get it right and fix it, because I don't know how to do that. I don't think anybody knows how to do that. But to be able to go, difference confronts me, because if I was Asian, my life would be significantly different. It was when I used to be Vietnamese. Um, <laughs> if, if I didn't have the mobility that I have, especially as a dancer, my life would be significantly different. I would be looked upon differently. I would be go about the world differently. There would be so much nuance to my life that would be so different. 
and partly we're afraid of this person that we're asking to say, I'm you, because we don't, we don't want to leave the discrimination practices that we know exist around many, many people. Yeah? So I'm not trying to disagree with what you're saying, and I love the giving, but it's also that, it, it's that recognition of, um, are we winding up? It's that recognition of what, ha what is it about being able to or not being able to have that thought or practice with somebody that may not necessarily fit a safe enough space. And I'm not running out like, I'm not expecting you to run out like a bunch of nutters and say I'm new to the whole world, but it is fun to go and do. Sorry, I did cut this woman off at the end. You sure? Yeah? All right, sorry. Um, can I just say thank you for participating in that. It's really hard to do this in a large group. And I, I hope I didn't ignore people down the back. That was absolutely not deliberate. Um, but thank you for participating. And if anything, I'm going to give you two words to take away and I'll email them. The two words are epistemological shudder. <laughs> so if everyone could say that together, epistemological shudder. Epistemological shudder. Epistemological shudder. Epistemological shudder. And no, it sounds rude, it sounds like you're going to do a wee, but it's not. It's, I'm not an epistemological shudder. Um, that's actually what this exercise is about, because epistemology is knowledge. So epistemological is what's in your head, and a shudder is a one of them. And so that's what it does. It shudders your knowledge. And when it shudders, it shatters a little bit, and it creates openings for new things. And so that's the purpose of this lovely confronting moment. And thank you for participating. And um, yes, yeah, it's been such a great day with you all. It's, yeah, thank you. Bye.